All righty. So hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to my little talk. Uh, so as you can see, the uh, the title is Old Monsters Are New Again, Changing Interpretations of Grendel's Mother in Beowulf. Uh, and just a little bit of background. Um, I have studied um, many Old English texts, texts uh, that was uh, medieval literature was one of my concentrations in both my uh, master's and PhD programs. Um, so, so one of the deep backgrounds of, of this talk came from a, a seminar that I attended or that I was a part of uh, that took place at the Newberry Library in Chicago, uh, where we translated all of the texts in the, in the Beowulf manuscript uh, and talked a lot about the, the thematic similarities in them. Uh, so I have, I guess, fairly extensive uh, experience with this text, although um, it's, it's been a little bit since I have uh, really di dove deep into it. Um, so I think this might actually be a uh, inspiration for me to do so again. Uh, so without further ado, uh, so this is just a, a, a ren digital rendering of the first page of, the, of Beowulf. Uh, if you are so inclined, you can go online and actually look at every single page of this text rendered digitally. It's pretty cool. Um, of course, I, you know, I'm a medievalist, so you know, manuscripts are one of those things I, I nerd over a lot. Uh, but this is just to give you a sense of of what of what this looks like. Uh, and the Beowulf manuscript, as it's so called, is is completely unique. There there are no other known copies of it. Uh, so you know, that's that's pretty cool. I think. Uh, so just kind of in in keeping with the theme of this. Uh, this series, I wanted to make some links to the Gothic and some of the concerns of the Gothic that uh, we've all been encountering over the past, you know, six, seven, however many months, years, it seems. Uh, so the, the Beowulf and the Gothic share these characteristics, I think. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about how people confront the monstrous in a lot of Gothic texts. And of course, there's a lot of discussions of what the monstrous actually is and means. And part of that is, you know, how do how do we separate the human from the monster? You know, how do people become monstrous? Uh, so, and, and Beowulf certainly gets into this discussion, and not just because we've got you know the famous three monsters in the text, but there are also characters that are rather suspect in a lot of different ways, including Beowulf himself. Uh, like the Gothic texts, um, you know, you've got the return of the repressed and other reflections of social, social anxieties of, of various sorts. Uh, in Beowulf, of course, you've, you've got um, the failings and the foibles of, of politics and courts. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things going on in, in, in Beowulf that that get into social anxieties. Uh, and another really important aspect of the Gothic is the often the contrast between culture or civilization with wild and other spaces. Uh, because you know the, the monsters in Beowulf, they, they exist in these spaces outside of human culture that are often very liminal in their, in their placement. Uh, so, um, so the the Beowulf and the Gothic share at least some of these thematic concerns. Uh, so, as you saw, this this talk it tries to focus on Grendel's mother, uh, and so she has been interpreted in, in a lot of different ways since the first translations of this text into contemporary English. And these, this first translation comes from uh, a, a scholar, uh, Thorkelin, I don't remember his first name off the top of my head, but, but he translated this in, in the, the late 1780s. Uh, so we, we have you know, 250 years or so of, of different scholars, critics, uh, artists, sort of dealing with Grendel's mother and what, what she means and what she's on about. Uh, so, as you see, the the key word that's often that's associated with her is aglachwif, which is commonly translated as monstrous woman, 
but the root word aglaka means hero. Uh, so if you want to go with the actual literal translation with which a lot of scholars don't use, it means, you know, heroic lady, heroic woman. Uh, and I'll get into more detail about how that actually works in the text itself. Uh, and so there are other words that are associated with her, and I'm going to bring those up real quick here. Um, so she is called simply Weef. Uh, she, she is called Ides, um, which that's woman or lady. Uh, she is also called Merwif, Brimwulf, Grundewergen, which means water woman, she wolf of the sea or sea wolf, uh, a cursed sea monster. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, the picture that we're supposed to get of, of Grendel's mother is, is, is someone who might be monstrous, but there are plenty of other heroes who, who are referred to as uh, basically sea wolves. So uh, that, is not a, that is not a term that's necessarily an insult, as long as it's attributed to a man. Uh, now clearly, and you know, if, you, if you look at the scholarship even a little bit, you can tell that sexism is a major part of how Grendel's mother, who is a formidable warrior uh, and an important, powerful woman, you know, how it's how scholars are inclined to make her out to be a monster. Uh, but the text itself is much more ambiguous and it gives us that room for the, the multiple views on who this on who this character is. It's also important to note that Grendel's mother is not physically described in the text at all. Uh, we get the sense that she has kind of longish fingernails uh, <laughs> when she tries to claw Beowulf's armor. <coughs> but other than that, we don't know what she looks like. And I just put the picture of Angelina Jolie. She played Grendel's mother in the 2007 movie, which I have not watched because I would probably spend most of the time yelling at it. Uh, but she probably doesn't look like Angelina Jolie, though she might. We, you know, we, we, we don't know. And I guess that's one of the great things about, about Grendel's mother is people can sort of project their own version of, of her um, in, in any sort of visual description. Uh, now, we don't know exactly why the, 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 the Beowulf poet didn't physically describe her, but my guess is either her audience was familiar enough with maybe other stories about her that they didn't have to include it or the poet would just rather have the audience sort of, again, project their own visions of Grendel's mother in their own mind movies. Okay, so I do need to talk a little bit about the context of the manuscript itself. Uh, it dates from the, the early 11th century. Uh, that, that date is pretty certain within, you know, 50 or 60 years, if I remember correctly. Um, but the text itself remained untranslated, as I said, until the 1780s. So it kind of, you know, sat around in uh, the archives, the collection of a guy named Noel, and then it was transferred to library where there was a fire that uh, damaged the manuscript. So parts, parts of some of the words are cut off. Uh, so there, there are there are some uncertainties about some of the words. Um, and what's really cool about the, the, the Noel Codex or the, the Beowulf manuscript is that it has these other texts in it. Uh, it has a life of St. Christopher and the saint's life is of course one of the most interesting and important genres of medieval literature. But what's really cool about this version is that St. Christopher has the head of a dog because uh, the land that he's from, all the, all the people have the heads of dogs. And I actually wrote my seminar paper on this because there is one, if I, there is one other account of St. Christopher that has a dog head and uh, there are other texts uh, where people, people have dog heads. Uh, another text as you see is the Wonders of the East, which is a, 
a, a classic medieval travelogue. Uh, so, you know, if you go go to these lands, you'll see people with with their faces in their chests and all sorts of weird and exotic uh, creatures and humanoids. Uh, the Letter of Alexander to Aristotle, which is another subgenre of of medieval literature. Uh, you've got Alexander's account of India uh, to to his um, to his teacher, and it, it is it's very much a travelogue where where Alexander discusses the weird and wonderful things that that he sees uh, in his ill-fated attempt to uh, conquer India. And finally, you've got the Old English Judith, which is one of the uh, few existing. Uh, Old English translations of biblical texts. Uh, so, so that that poem, that text is very well studied. Uh, but all of these have all of these you can find in translation in various places on the internet. Uh, but whoever collated um, the text in this manuscript clearly had the the theme the themes of the monstrous, the wonders, the terrible. Uh, so that was part of what we that what we studied when I when I took that seminar is is. How are these how are these texts thematically linked? So and I don't know how familiar all of you are with with Beowulf as as a as a text. Uh, th those of us in the United States, I think most of us have have had this poem subjected to us when we were in high school or maybe or maybe in college. Um, and you know, just to be a little uncharitable, probably most of the time the people teaching Beowulf probably shouldn't have. Uh, but um, the, the, the story itself is a very, it's a rich and varied text. Yes, you have the three famous monsters, but you also have a lot of discussion of, of the of court of court and politics in, in this in this world. So so the text spends almost or more time on how Beowulf and the other people sort of negotiate um, negotiate the the politics um, and and you know with with you know with Beowulf as as a hero, there's a lot of examination in it of what hero actually means in this society, and of course you know the as typical in old English literature, there's a lot of concern with death and sort of the the inevitable transience of life. Uh, almost any old English text that you read, that's one of the biggest um, one of the biggest themes. Uh, the story itself takes place in around the the sixth century in, in Scandinavia. So, what is now Sweden and and Denmark? Those are the primary uh, locations. And Beowulf itself is an interpolation of a clearly very old pre Christian story with with biblical morality and biblical characters uh, that are that are interpolated into it and there's a lot of scholarship back and forth about just how well well integrated the the, the christian and non-christian elements are uh, you know that's that's a whole separate thing uh, but like all probable oral tales um, beowulf was an old story when it was written down finally. So, so this, this is a story that had probably been circulating for, you know, most likely centuries, just like a lot of oral literature. Um, and then, you know, when it was finally written down, of course, it gets, it gets codified. But if you, if you look at the way that the, the poem was written, you know, it's, pr it's pretty clear about, it's pretty clear that there is a, there is a very strongly oral element to it. And if any of you are familiar with sort of the dynamics of, of other oral traditional stories that get put into writing, you know, like the, like the Homeric epics, for example, uh, the dynamics, even though the languages are different, the dynamics are, are, are very much similar. Uh, and I just need to then briefly mention Old English poetics. Because of course the, the 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 form of the poetry you know informs how how you read the text, uh, and so Old English verse, you know, some of you might know, is is alliterative in nature and is commonly divided into two half lines with sort of this 
caesura, this pause uh, in between. Uh, it's got two stressed syllables and the alliteration happens you know, be, between the half lines. And so I included the, the, the first three lines of the poem uh, in this to, just to give you a sense of, of, what, this, of what this looks like. Uh, so I'll just read, read them to you. Quat we gardena in yardagum, field kuniga thrim yefrunen, who thus athlingest Ellen Fremedon. So, so when you when you hear it spoken, I, you know there's a certain there's a certain rhythm to it that that the alliteration emphasizes. Um, and even though this is a written text, uh, I, I think Old English for me sounds better when when it's spoken because because it it is it, it's a really sort of evocative uh, evocative language. Okay, so here's, here's, here's a quote that sort of summarizes uh, the, the importance of the monsters in the text. Uh, so this is, this is from uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and from his important essay, Mon Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. He says, the monsters are not an inexplicable blunder of taste. They are essential, fundamentally allied to the underlying ideas of the poem which give it its lofty tone and high seriousness. Uh, so here is where I want to at least get into a little discussion of, of Tolkien's uh, work on Beowulf. Uh, and it's especially important because his really was the first major scholarly work that took the presence of the monsters as a serious uh, vital portion of the text. So really before Tolkien, uh, critics ignored the monsters or thought that the monsters were part of the primitive superstitious um, lack of sophistication on the part of the, of the Beowulf poet. Uh, and you know, Tolkien spends this article saying, uh, nope, that's not the way it works. Uh, and another important thing about this text, and if you get into Beowulf scholarship, this is actually one of the first articles that you'll read because what Tolkien does is he really effectively summarizes the scholarship up to 1936. Uh, so, so you get a really good sense of what people were saying about it in the first century or so of the scholarship on it. Um, and he does spend a lot of time refuting various prevailing views on the poem and not just the monsters, but he gets into the theology and the history and, and other aspects of it. Ironically for this talk though, he barely mentions Grendel's mother. Uh, her mention is relegated to a parenthetical last paragraph of part of one of his appendices. Uh, and so that's, that's where I got all of the, the different words that are associated with with Grendel's mother, so so Tolkien lists them, but that's basically all we see of Grendel's mother in in that text. So you kind of want to poke Tolkien for that. Um, he does talk about other women in it, but for some reason not Grendel's mother. Uh, so because Beowulf is such a rich rich text, uh, you have a lot of scholars who are interested in the specific Scandinavian slash English historical context uh, because the because the text spends a lot of time talking about court and politics, there is a lot of stuff in it about economic relationships, you know, how women are peace weavers, how women and nobles are part of their essential function is to give presents and other favors to their, their underlings. So one of the primary marks of a good king is that they make sure to distribute resources amongst their following. And if you don't, you know, you're, you're, you're a bad king. Uh, and more recently in the past, you know, 20, 25 years, of course, the, the presence of women in the text uh, have been extensively studied because yes, Grendel's mother is probably the most famous woman in the text, but you also have these various noble women throughout it who, who, who play a very important role in court life. Uh, for example, the character Wealthiao, 
who is essentially the, 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 the woman head of Herod, she is, you know, she passes the cup, she heads ceremonies, she is also a ring giver and distributor of wealth. Um, so so there, there's, a, there's a lot of mention of, of women's roles in this. And of course, you've got a lot of discussion of religion and philosophy, and not just because of the the this balance or this this presence of both Christian and, and non-Christian elements. So just a little note about the translation itself that 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 I used. Uh, the 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 translator Maria Davana Headley is uh, is an author and editor and published. She's got several novels published in both YA and other genre fiction uh, categories. Um, and she writes in her introduction, and I really highly recommend this translation. It's 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 probably the favorite one that I've read, and I've read <laughs> a number of them. Um, she started because she read about Grendel's mother and like a compendium of mythical creatures, monsters, when she was a kid. Uh, so she was drawn in by the by this this formidable character, and you know she is. And Grendel's mother is often depicted again as sort of this vile looking green colored ogress or sea serpent type creature. Uh, and I think she said she said that that the depiction of Grendel's mother that she saw was of this sort of piteous ogre type uh, creature. Uh, and the really cool thing about this translation is that she combines contemporary vernacular like swole and stan. Uh, there are some others in there. And she uses plenty of obscenity, so there's fucking shit and stuff like that. But she also combines that with, she really works hard to keep some of the alliterative nature of the original language, which really gives the, the, the text a, a sense of quick movement that other translations don't, because other translations will often tend to make all the language archaic. So, you know, it, they pretend like you're reading, you know, 17th or 18th century English, which as far as I'm concerned, doesn't work for, for Beowulf. Uh, yes, the Beowulf poet does use archaizing language to some extent, but it is a very sort of vital text. Okay, so then want to spend, you know, plenty of time going over the, the, the episode itself. Uh, so Beowulf is over 3,000 lines. Um, and so this episode, this episode is around 400 lines or so. So it really doesn't take up a huge part of the poem, but it does transition Beowulf's fight against the, this family into a longer discussion of, of his experiences at court and the and the politics before you get to the dragon at the end. Yes, and yes, and spoilers for an over one thousand year old poem. Beowulf dies. He was he's killed by the dragon. Uh, so, of course, Beowulf is essentially summoned to the hall of Hrothgar uh, because Grendel has been raiding uh, Herod for twelve days. 12 years. Uh, so, so Grendel comes and takes the warriors, whether sleeping, gobble, you know, takes them back to his lair and gobbles them up. Uh, and there's some pretty good descriptions of, of the, the bloody death and destruction that, uh, that Grendel causes. And that the primary cause for Grendel's complaint is literally Herod is really loud. So the warriors party all night uh, get really drunk and sing loudly, and, and you know Grendel, whose whose lair is nearby, is continuously disturbed by this. Grendel gets fed up and starts eating people. Uh, so so Beowulf shows up and pledges to rid uh, rid the land of this terrible monster. And you know Grendel does. Uh, Beowulf does. He kills Grendel with his bare hands. And of course, that means that in the day after he is victorious against Grendel, Grendel's mother, who is in mourning and who is outraged, enraged by the death of her son, 
she comes and raids the hall and kills people, including Hrothgar's best friend. So, and one of the things that, the, that this text does is it really analyzes Beowulf's place in these societies, that he is in large part a very disruptive sort of figure, very much like a lot of the, 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 the Greek heroes that yes, they go in and do great deeds, but they, they very often leave chaos and destruction uh, in their wake. And Beowulf is no exception. So, so in, this, in this episode, Hrothgar is angry because Beowulf has drawn the household into a blood feud with Grendel's mother. Uh, and if you know anything about blood feuds, of course, they have a tendency to go on and on and on. On. So naturally, you know, besides the death of his best friend, Hrothgar is, is pissed at Beowulf for, for getting, getting him into yet another bad scrape. So of course Beowulf says, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to rid you of this problem now too. Um, and we, we find out that like Grendel, Grendel's mother is also from the line of Cain. Uh, so, and in and sort of in, in many medieval texts, monsters, humanoid monsters are very often from the line of Cain. That is, you know, you know, he Cain represents, you know, sort of corrupted, corrupted humanity. So it's no surprise that monsters then sort of spawn from, from this line. But the text doesn't talk about who Grendel's father was. So, so we, we, we have no clue his, <coughs> who's, on, who's on his father's line. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe the monster, maybe a monster was his father. You know, maybe it was another kind of union. We, we, we don't know. Uh, so, so again, this is a case of maybe the audience knew who Grendel's father was from extant stories, or it maybe it's just not important uh, <laughs> that the Beowulf poet excluded it because it's like, well, it really doesn't. It really doesn't matter for uh, for the story. So Beowulf takes this task upon himself again, and as Beowulf does, and he spends a lot of time doing this, he brags about his prowess, how he's going to go in the mirror where Grendel's mother lives and, you know, dispatch, dispatch her post haste. Well, it doesn't quite work that, that way. Uh, so Beowulf enters, enters the mirror and God or whatever divine entity gives Beowulf the ability to breathe underwater. But almost as soon as he enters the mirror, Grendel's mother grabs him uh, or you know, in D and D terms, he's grappled, so so he can't he can't attack, um, and you know she tries to claw him, and it doesn't pierce his armor, but but he can't. He's essentially helpless, and while he's being dragged down, you've got these other sea monsters and sea creatures that are sort of swirling around, um, and when they get down to the bottom, Grendel's mom throws Beowulf into her halls. I mean, it's three says she basically tosses him uh, and then they fight, but Beowulf is almost defeated. Uh, he, comes very, he comes very close to dying and, and he says, he's thinking, well, well, this is it. Um, you know, I'm gonna die. Um, I won't be able to give my troop treasure. They'll be leaderless. Well, <laughs> so, so, so be it. Um, but his, 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 first sword, the sword that he was lent by one of uh, Hrothgar's courtiers, um, a guy named Unferth, uh, who is an adversary of Beowulf's in court. Um, and if you're, if you're at all familiar with the Lord of the Rings, you, know, you might know the character, remember the character Grima Wormtongue in the court of Theoden. Unferth is basically that kind of character. And you know, Tolkien was a medievalist, so he 
very clearly understands the, the role of the, the, the treacherous uh, advisor courtier, but Unferth, out of the goodness of his heart, maybe, uh, donates his ancestral sword to Beowulf to use, the sword named Hrunting. Now, Unferth's sword fails, uh, doesn't, doesn't penetrate Grendel's mother's skin, just kind of bounces off her head. So again, Beowulf is close to being ripped apart, stabbed by, by Grendel's mom because she is a formidable warrior. Uh, she is almost his equal. But then there's divine intervention. God shines a light on this giant's sword that, that is in Grendel's mother's basically hoard. He manages to grab it and dispatches Grendel's mother. But not content with that, Beowulf then desecrates Grendel's body, takes his head, uh, and then you know surfaces back up with Grendel's head and some some treasure that he stole. <laughs> so basically, if you want to get you know he rolled very well on his divine intervention, uh, uh, and and he's he's saved by this sword, but this sword then dissolves, you know it melts away in in the light. Uh, after after he's done dispatching Grendel's mother. Uh, so uh, kind of an interesting side note is that when when the spectators see the water starting to bubble and they see blood, the, the old men of the, the court just kind of lament and run away because, oh, well, no, Beowulf's dead, we're doomed. Uh, <laughs> but his his troop sort of stays and then, you know, Beowulf pops up and it's like, hey, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, so that's kind of the, the episode in a nutshell. But, uh, but as you see, Grendel's mother is not just simply a monster. Uh, she, she is, you know, she's a warrior. She's an aggrieved, she's an aggrieved uh, mourning mother. She controls, sea, she controls sea monsters. She's the ruler of her own hall. Um, and so as, as I was uh, preparing this, this presentation, I kind of stumbled upon a thesis that goes with the text in general, and that that Beowulf is an example of what Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin, called a heterogl you know heteroglossic text, uh, and that he developed this theory in regard to novels specifically because his contribution to scholarship was you know a lot of theory of the novel. But that one of the chief characteristics of novels is that you have multiple kinds of utterances within a single text. And he uses a, an example from, from Dickens, where Dickens marks the people of different social classes through their dialect. Um, and there are a lot of other examples of this. Though, ironically enough, Bakhtin denies that epic poetry could have these characteristics. And, you know, he's wrong. <laughs> at least about Beowulf, because as I've mentioned, it's clear that the Beowulf poet is very much a traditional shope or the, 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 the court bard poet and a knowledgeable Christian. Uh, and the text, you have both voices that are, that are integrated into the, the larger narrative. Um, and I would also, and I think I would also put point out, which I didn't in the previous talk, that clearly this poet knows a lot about court life. Uh, so, so I mean, that's one of the reasons why people suggest that the Beowulf po poet wrote the text for a royal or a noble court, because they they clearly know a lot about the dynamics of of how these sorts of societies work. Now, Grendel's mother herself doesn't speak, um, but she is a multi-layered character, uh, as, I, as I said before. So, so, so she's not just this, she's not just this monster that is an obstacle for, for Beowulf, that, you know, that she has a legitimate grievance. And the, the text really points that out, that, that unlike Grendel, 
whose violence primarily seems to be random and spiteful, Grendel's mother's is not. Uh, that the fact that Hrothgar is like you put it, you drew us into a blood feud, um, and so so you know Grendel's mother's actions are perfectly uh, perfectly acceptable in that kind of retributive justice sense. Uh, and so sort of wrapping up um, that we can look at um, the Gothic as taking a lot of things from what the Middle Ages were, were perceived to be. Um, and those kinds of things are reflected in, in Gothic texts. So, you know, we've all seen how so many Gothic texts have, you know, sort of spooky, ruined, crumbling medieval castles. Uh, there's a lot of, of course, contrast and, and discussion of, you know, quote unquote, civilization versus nature and, and how wild nature is a threat of various kinds to, to civilized life. You've got the corruption, the corrupt monks and nuns um, all over the place. And you've got the monstrous feminine, <coughs> which is you know, a, a common trope in, in, in so many Gothic texts. Uh, and of course, there, the, the whole idea of medieval times as you know, dark, unenlightened, superstitious, um, you know, Catholic, uh, um, you know, provide, provides, uh, provides these sorts of anxieties that um, enlightened Protestant um, writers and enlightened Protestant society, you know, they see the Middle Ages as a point of, well, this is the way things used to be, and we're scared that this stuff is going to come back, you know. And so, so yes, not yes. There were goth, there were Catholic Gothic writers, but there there is a lot of sort of Protestant based fear uh, in Gothic texts that stem from the the traumas of the Reformation and and all that. Now, that's not to say that in the Middle Ages themselves there were plenty of anti clerical texts, because you know the theme of corruption of the church is actually a very consistent <laughs> medieval trope. Uh, you know, you, you had, you know, not too long before the Re Reformation, you had the Lollards in England, who, whose uh, philosophies and ideas were very similar to what you get in the Reformation not too much later. We, can we should read the Bible for ourselves. We need to rid ourselves of, of this, the tyranny of, of the, the clergy. Uh, so, the Gothic writers were not in any way, shape, or form original in, in sort of how they depicted uh, the, 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 the superstitious Catholic past. Um, and I don't know how, how or if any of the Gothic writers were familiar with these medieval texts, um, but I don't think it's a coincidence that Beowulf and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and these other medieval texts were published in modern, were first published in modern translations when the Gothic was being developed and, uh, and developing as a literary genre. Um, <clears throat> so if there's not a direct influence, the, the, the Gothic writers were working in this sort of larger cultural context where, where the, the various nation states of Europe were trying to define what a national literature was. And that was an impetus behind the translations of a lot of these texts. Okay. Uh, and so here's just a, a short bibliography of, of some of the more recent scholarship on, on Grendel's mother in particular. Um, when, I was, when I was looking around, I was uh, trying to find ones that are available online, mostly full text to read. And there are certainly plenty of others, but these were sort of ones that when I looked over them uh, and their abstracts uh, were, were kind of pertinent. Um, so you have one that's, that's 40 years old, but as I'm looking at it, 
I didn't mention this last time, but I actually remember now reading this text when I was doing Beowulf studies um, in graduate school. So, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty important text in terms of Beowulf scholarship in general and, and Grendel's mother in particular. Uh, so in addition, of course, you have um, Be uh, Tolkien's Beowulf monster and the critics. And again, you, you can find that full text uh, online if you're, if you're interested in it. Okay, so I guess that that finishes my talk. So thank you for listening and uh, certainly interested to hear what questions you might have. Thank you so much. Um, that was great again. Um, would you be okay to stop sharing? Yep, there we go, already done. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Eric. So I don't think like this morning, um, I, well, this morning, the evening, afternoon, whatever it was, the earlier one, um, I already had quite a few questions to ask, but I don't think we've got any so far. So people do feel free to uh, pop some questions in and I will stop the recording so that people can feel free to ask.